Good morning, everybody. Please be seated. Thank you for the very warm and last welcome. <laughs> you know, they say all good things come to an end. But I say it comes to a temporary end. Right? Nothing comes to a permanent end. Our God is a good God. And I'd like to sincerely thank our dear Pastor Anne for inviting me to this wonderful conference and to meet all you wonderful saints. And like, like I shared with you the story last night about this Middle Eastern woman who came looking for a man of God. She found him not, but she found the Lord Jesus. So at the end of the day, only the Lord will be with us throughout the ends of time. Speakers can come and go, but the Lord Jesus is always with us. Amen? So it is him that we should hold on to. God uses wonderful men of God to teach us, to edify us, to prepare us for his coming. But man is always man, you know, right? They are fallible, they can fall, they can rise, they can be restored. But our good God is always with us throughout the ends of age and who teach us good things. You know, have you seen birds? I'm, see, I'm sure you have seen birds, little birds. When they are hungry, they open wide their mouth and their eyes are hardly open, you know. But they open their mouth wide open, giving out little shrieks of shout at the same time. And that is a sign that they are hungry. So the mother bird flies away and looks for some food and then she brings it to give to these little birds. And these little birds' eyes are not open yet. So there is a risk of eating wrong food. Right? There is a risk that the enemy can come and feed the bird. There is a risk. But the mother makes sure no enemy comes to feed its own, who will open its mouth and look up to the mother. In the same way, when you keep your heart pure, sincere, undefiled, then no demon is going to come to bring wrong teachings because the Holy Spirit will make sure that we are not deceived. But if we don't keep our hearts pure, if there is leaven, if there is hypocrisy, then we will attract these false spirits, these false demons. It will attract, you know, your spirit will attract them. It sends out, see your spirit becomes like a hotspot and sends out Wi-Fi signals. It's true, I'm just using today's uh, technological terms, but that's exactly what it is. It sends out a signal, you know. Okay, just like if you turn on your cell phone, you turn on the Wi-Fi, whatever signals are available in the vicinity, your mobile device picks up, right? Either your iPad, your mobile devices, mobile phone, or your laptop, it picks up and tells you, all the hotspots that are available. And then you click what you want. So in the same manner, when you think wrong thoughts, when you think thoughts that are not holy, thoughts that are not good, thoughts that are not lively, thoughts that, that are not honest, thoughts that are not pure, when you think that, you know, your mind is a hot spot. It sends out waves of signals and there are evil ravens, crows, demons waiting there. And you know, they smell that. Just like the sharks in the water. They smell blood, right? They sense the blood. When a diver dives into the water, it doesn't bother the shark. Have you seen documentaries like that? See, divers go very near to the shark. 
I used to wonder, you know, this divers who go into the water, they take pictures of the sharks, and the shark and they seem to coexist peacefully. I don't disturb you, you don't disturb me. But the moment there is a cut in the flesh, and blood comes out of the flesh, the shark senses the blood, and then it goes after the victim. In the same manner, when we think thoughts that are not lively, according to Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, you will transmit those waves. You start transmitting them. When you start transmitting them, those ravens and the demons who are already waiting for its prey will come flocking towards you. And then they instill, put in you, or not put in you, they start sitting on your head and start hatching those eggs or laying those eggs. First they lay the eggs. Secondly, they sit on your head to hatch the eggs. When you continue to meditate on those thoughts, and when the eggs are hatched, then comes the little demon. And the little demon will burrow a hole into you. They burrow the hole into you. From the mind, it goes into your spirit. You know, I'm telling you in a very detailed process, but all this can take place in a fraction of a second. It burrows a hole into your spirit. Once it goes into your spirit, then your flesh will act out what is already here. So it first starts in the mind. Then it's conceived in the heart. Your heart is like a womb that becomes pregnant with that thought. And then... A woman doesn't carry a baby forever, only maximum nine months, ten months, right? After that, the baby has to come out. In the same manner, when your heart becomes pregnant with that evil thought, then times come for delivery. The delivery is acting out in the flesh. Let me give you a very good biblical example. Now, this is the appetizer, okay? So you don't have to write down all this. <laughs> Keep it in your heart. Keep it in your heart. Sometimes you write, you'll forget, you know. Keep it in your heart. Second Samuel chapter 11. You can write if you like to, you know. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 onwards. During the times when all the kings go for war. See, there's a season when all the kings go for war. Everyone went for war except the hero of our story. He decided to take a break. He decided to go on a sabbatical. He decided to go on a vacation. He worked so hard for God and he thought, I need a break. I need a sabbatical. I need to go on a vacation. Sometimes it's dangerous, you know, to take a break away from God. When you are called by God, there is no retirement. The only retirement is when you are called by God to come home. That's when you retire. Till then, there is no retirement. Isn't God good? Okay, anyway. So, King David decided to take a break. <coughs> so, all his soldiers are gone. All his generals are gone. He's so lonely. So he decided to go for a walk. You know, palaces are very huge. You can go from one corner of the palace to another corner of the palace and you still have only reached half or a small part of the kingdom. So he decided to go for a walk. As he was walking, you know, sometimes you tend to look out, right? You're not always looking up the sky. See, like I told you about the houses in India, they all have flat roofs. So in the summer or in other times, people go up on the rooftop to have a cup of tea and while they are drinking a cup of tea or they just, they will tend to look down what's going on in the street. 
and in the street people be walking up and down, all kinds of activities, festivities all take place. So, King David looked out and he happened to see a woman stark naked and bathing. If you just happen to see, it's no fault of you. Everybody agree? You just walk away. Oops. Oops. And you walk away. Right? That's not a sin. You just, oops. Oh, so sorry. You walk, you walk away. That's not your fault. But what did King David do? He said, oops. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He came back to have a second serving. And he looked. And he looked. And he looked. Say first, as he started looking, he began to send out signals. And when he sent out signals, the spirit of lust, the spirit of fornication, the spirit of adultery, who were like vultures flying around that region. And they all zoom in into King David. All zoom in. And they began to sit on his head. And he looked, and he looked, and he looked. And he began to conceive how nice it would be if I go to bed with her. Now that thought is consuming his mind. So he decided, I must get this woman's phone number. How can I get a phone number? So he texts his security. Come and see me right now. So he texts his security and the security came. And he came on the double and says, Sir, what do you, what's your call, sir? He said, I want you to get me the address of this woman. So, you know, the security, whether they like it or they don't like it, they have to do their master's bidding, right? Sometimes I tell my stuff like that, no? Look, don't ask questions, do it. <laughs> Nothing evil. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, secretaries are too good, they give unsolicited opinions. So that's when I tell them, look, I, I didn't ask for your opinion. I just said, do it. That's all. If I ask for your opinion, then you give me. Anyway. <laughs> so, and the security went. And he found out and he reported back, sir, she is none other than your general, Uriah's wife. Okay. Once you hear that she's somebody's wife, what should you do? Oops! Oops! Then the oops become bigger oops. Right? You just walk away. But, instead of oops, you begin, oh, I see. Okay. But you see, by now, the lust has come deep inside him. He was not burning with lust. It doesn't matter whether it's somebody's wife or nobody's wife. It can even be somebody's grandma. It didn't matter anymore. Because you're not consumed with lust. If you did Romans chapter 8, it gives the progression or the evolution of lust. So King David went to bed with her. He went to bed with her. And now the poor woman had no choice because he's the king. Right? When the king summons you, you are just a subject in the king's palace. You have to obey. So she bowed down to his demands, whether she liked it or she didn't like it. Now, after this, nothing happened. It was a one night stand. Nothing happened, okay? Goodbye, goodbye. Everybody, goodbye. After three months or two months, she found out that she was pregnant. Now, during that time, the soldiers go for war for a long season, like going to 
Iraq or Vietnam. They, they are stationed there for months, right? They are stationed there for months and now Uria's wife is pregnant. So she sent a message to, she texted King David. See, after that one night stand, they exchanged phone numbers, you know. <laughs> Come on, don't they do that? Right, they do that. So they exchanged phone numbers. So she texts King David. Honey, she now no more king. <laughs> you people laugh as you have never heard all this before. <laughs> Honey, I am in trouble. I am pregnant. Uh oh. Now what shall we do now? So, now you see, you made a mistake. Now you need to cover up your mistake. Oh, in those days, they don't have abortion clinics. If they had abortion clinics, King David would have made an appointment for her to go and see a doctor. Cover up. Nobody knows anything, like what they do today. Right? So in those days, they had no abortion clinics, so they have to go through the pregnancy. So King David came up with a clever plan. Okay, before things get out of hand, let's do something. He called for Uriah to come back on the pretext to ask him, how's everything going on in the war? Give me an update. So Uriah, you know, so innocent soldier, he gives an update to the king about what's happening in the front. So David said, oh, that's so good. Okay, all right. Since you have been there for a month, why don't you take three days break? Go, have some fun time with your wife. Go, 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 go. So Uriah went. You know, when you come out from a long season, you want to have a good time with your wife. That was King David's plan. So King David planned, if Uriah had slept with his wife, then when she becomes pregnant, David's sin is covered. So you wouldn't know the child whose father the child really is. So his plan failed. Not once, not twice, thrice. The plan failed. Uriah's mind was so much in the war that he couldn't think of having a jolly good time with his wife because all his colleagues and the rest of them have sacrificed their wives and their families. They are out there in the war. And he told King David, how can I have a good time? I cannot. I denied myself and he stayed away from his wife. So what to do now? You cannot hide the stomach, right? It was getting bigger. Little bump began to show. Whenever you ride, you drive a car on the road, you see a bump, they say bump ahead. Be careful, go slow, right? <laughs> so when the bump began to show, King David knew, okay, now it's danger. Have to go slow, have to think. And he planned another plan. So he called Joab, another one of his general. Now, look carefully. When King David committed adultery, God did not rebuke him. That does not mean God condoned the sin. He kind of just overlooked it. When she conceived, God did not say Nathan the prophet to condemn King David. The Lord just kept quiet. But when King David schemed for an innocent man to be killed, see that is shedding of innocent blood, that was very, very serious in the eyes of God. Because once innocent blood is shed on the ground, that blood cries out to God. That is why when you kill your babies, that sin is very, very grievous, you know. Whether it is one month fetus, as long as it is a fetus, it is life. And that life will cry out to God. You know, my youngest sister, she got married very young, 18 years old. She was madly in love. When you're mad in love, you're mad. 
it's true you know the brain doesn't work anymore common sense doesn't work anymore because you're mad you're mad I told my younger sister that boy is not good it's not good he's not the right life partner for you she wouldn't listen because you're mad you know and I told my parents don't agree for this marriage so they stood by me because I was adamant I said no this is not the right boy but then you know she began to coax the parents and she's the youngest so the parents you know naturally we moved moved by their little girl coming you know pulling the mother's skirt mommy 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 also finally they agreed against all my advices so she married this he's a real loafer you know <laughs> that's true i am not ashamed to say that till to, till today he's a loafer anyway they got married they got married and uh, she conceived she conceived and she aborted the baby because her husband told her we are not ready you are 18 i am 20 so we are not ready let's not abort this baby not once not twice three times oh on the third time on the third time she conceived and she didn't want to abort anymore okay by this time she became a believer she became a believer so she heard good teachings that it's wrong to have an abortion but her husband was forcing her to abort the baby so she came to me she cried to me she told me a problem she said please pray that God will take away this baby I said are you nuts <laughs> I said so many women who couldn't conceive they come to me for prayer and ask for prayer that they can conceive and women who are married for 10 years 12 years some 15 years recently a woman came to me is married for 25 years and she asked me please pray that God will bless us and I prayed and God blessed her she conceived when she was 45 or 50 years old she conceived and uh, and here you are asking me that God should remove this I said I cannot she started crying she said if God will not do it then my husband is going to force me to go to the abortion clinic and have an abortion so she cried and she cried and she cried so I looked at her you know she was sitting before me tears rolling down her eyes I didn't know what to do I said okay you go home after three days I will let you know my answer so I fasted and prayed for three days and I asked the Lord about this situation so the Lord told me children are a gift from me I have given her this gift but now she's rejecting this gift okay you do one thing command the OV to come out of her body but I will shut her womb from that day and she it will never be open again and when they really want a baby it will never be granted unto them unless they truly cry out to me so I then prayed and commanded the OVU to come out of her body and at that moment my sister was living about maybe 50 miles away from my home and she felt at that moment she this is what she told me later and we compared the time she felt that she should go to the restroom and she, as she was in the bathroom that OVU came out of her body and her womb was shut for 10 long years for 10 years God shut her womb and she cried and she cried and she wanted a baby all the best wonderful saintly men of God in India my mother wrote letters to all of them asking them to pray 
I told my mother, don't waste your time. <laughs> it will never happen. Because the God who speaks to those men of God is the same God who said, the womb is shut. But mothers are mothers, you know. They never listen. <laughs> they don't listen, you know. Because they are, their hearts are full of grace and compassion. Right? All mothers? Am I right, mothers? So, after that, my sister used to tell me that whenever she's sleeping, she would dream, and a baby about this size will come and stand on a chair and weep and cry to her, Mommy, why did you kill me? Mommy, why did you kill me? Every day she'll have this nightmare. The baby will come and cry to her, Mommy, why did you kill me? Mommy, why did you kill me? Three babies. It's life, you know. And that life cries out to God. Twenty years ago, I was in Chicago. And my hostess is a medical nurse. And she had a situation. A woman in her prayer group conceived. And in her mid-pregnancy, I think when she was four or five, four months pregnant, the doctors found out that uh, her baby is going to have Down syndrome. So the doctors advise her to abort the baby. So now, what to do? Can we abort under such situation? Then would you want to raise up a Down syndrome baby? Or a deformed baby? Or an invalid baby? Or blind, deaf, dumb baby? Or a totally mentally retarded baby? That all your life you, you want to feel that it is a, a thorn in your flesh? What will you decide? So this problem came to her. Just about that time I have visited their church, so she brought the problem to me. She said, you talk with God. Now you ask God, what shall we do? I'm given peculiar cases, you know. <laughs> Doctor, you treat patient, you get money. I treat patient, I get no money. <laughs> so I prayed. I asked the Lord, Lord, this is the situation. What? would you counsel that I should tell this family? The Lord just answered the one word. He said, a life is a life. Period. Whether it's deformed or anything, a life is a life. So I told the lady this answer. So she asked me, what does it mean? Well, it means by itself. A life is a life. So, you have no right to kill that life. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up for a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your holy presence. In the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ, this morning. Open our ears, open our hearts, that we may hear what the Spirit of God will speak to us today. In the name of our dear, blessed Lord Jesus, we pray, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. On Thursday, at about 7 in the evening, we check into the hotel, here in Houston, as I entered into my room to lay my luggage down and then go out for a meal, as soon as I laid my luggage down, I felt the moving of the Spirit upon me. And I knelt down and I began to pray in unknown tongues. And then came this message where the Lord asked me a question. Have you considered the four apocalyptic horses mentioned in Revelation chapter 6, 
from a different perspective. So, you know, I'm sure you may have heard about the four horsemen from Revelation chapter 6. And our dear Pastor Anne shared about the pale horse, what uh, about it being the Antichrist and the Muslim thing and all that. And we have heard about many different, dif different interpretations about the four horsemen. But that day, the Lord allowed me to see from a, a different perspective. You know, everything in the scripture, there are seven layers of revelation. The first layer is a layer that is natural interpretation. Then there are six other spiritual revelations that the Lord can make us look at different perspective. And just like a kaleidoscope. You know, you, you turn the kaleidoscope in one direction, you see different, different dimensions, different shapes. You turn it another way, it's like endless. That's how it is. So, and the Lord began to teach me what they represented. So, now turn your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6 tells us about all the seven seals that are going to be broken. Among the seven seals, the first four relates to the four horses that John the Revelator was allowed to see. So when the first seal was broken, one of the living creatures told John, come and see. So when the seal was broken, so John came near and he looked into the scroll and there came a galloping white horse. That's the first horseman, a white horse. Now what does that white horse represent? False religion, false religion, false God, false Messiah. See, something that is white represents purity, represents holiness, represents something that is good. You don't wear a white dress or a white shirt to a funeral, do you? No, you wear a black to a funeral service to show that you are sorrowful because white is happiness, white lily, happiness, joy, something that is wonderful. And here comes a white horse that is anti of everything that is good. So it gives you the appearance that is something that is good, but it is not the real thing. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, the Lord Jesus comes on a white horse. And here you see another white horse. So are we going to think, oh, this is that horse? In Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, the Bible says the Lord Jesus Christ is like the Lion of Judah. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says that the devil comes like a roaring lion. So, the devil pretends to be like the Lord Jesus. Whatever the Lord Jesus stands for, he duplicates. Because he vowed that I will be like the most high God. So that is his ultimate aim, to be like God, to be equal with God. He couldn't, so on this earth, he want to duplicate everything that is of Christ to be like Christ. So we have a true religion. Now comes a false religion. We have a true God. Now comes a false God. We have a true Messiah. Now comes a false Messiah. And the white horse also represents the false prophets that will come. All bearing the name of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ warned us in Matthew 24, 24 that false prophets will arise in large numbers in the last days. And in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, the Apostle John also warned us that false prophets have gone out in his time. In AD 90, 
John calls that those are the last days and the crisis have gone out. If AD 90, the first century, were the last days, what are these days? The end of the last days. So if those, their times were bad, our times is the climax of the bad, is the worst of all. You and I need great faith to survive these last days. We need great grace, great faith. That is why the Lord Jesus said, for the elect's sake, time will be shortened. What time? Not earth time, you know, your time. I used to think that time shortened is earth time until the Lord once told me that's not earth time, it's your time. Meaning, what, how, old, how long does an average person live? 80, 90? Americans? What? 80 or 90? 80? Okay, let's stay, stay on the safe side, 80. In India, we are much better, 60. <laughs> so, when the scripture says, when the Lord said, the time will be shortened, depending on your faith, only God knows how strong your faith is. If he, if he sees that you cannot survive, he shortens your time from 80 to 60. So in your good, rightful age of your prime in the Lord, the Lord calls you, come home, my daughter. Come home. Because to leave you is a risk of you losing your faith, losing your soul. So the Lord won't want that to happen. He won't risk that. So he comes, come home. But if you're strong in the faith, the Lord knows, okay, they can last through the fire. So he leaves you behind. Come on, go through the fire. <laughs> Isn't it good? It's fun, you know. If the Lord knows you're so strong in your faith, okay, leave them. Let them be fed to the lions. They can tear the lion apart to pieces like Samson. Amen. See, time will be shortened. So false prophets have gone out. They will come out. And in these last days, when God is raising up a last day's company of prophets, at the same time, the devil is also raising up a last day's company of false prophets. See, all the false prophets that the devil will raise up, the climax is the ultimate false prophet who will work hand in hand together with the Antichrist. So he needs to come. And all these little false prophets are making the way, preparing the way for the ultimate false prophet to come. He's already here. And then false teachers. You have good teachers of the word, and you'll have false teachers of the word. Second Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Now all the scripture already gives us guidelines about the fruit of a false prophet. Fruit of the false teacher. Fruit of the false Christ. Fruit of the false apostles. They're all there. You need to know the scriptures. Once you know the scriptures, then you can see those identifying marks of a false prophet, false teacher, false Christ, false apostle. They are there. One cardinal fruit of the false teachers, false prophets, false apostles, false Christ, false church is an overemphasis of money. A lust for money. Overemphasis. 
we all need money, you know. We need money to survive. We need money to do the ministry. I have a television network in India, not one, one network, 12 channels in eight different languages. And it costs us hundreds of thousands of dollars, at least close to half a million dollars every month to run our network. So, but I've never ever anywhere put money first. I've always believed this. And I was a high school teacher before the Lord called me to the ministry. And when I resigned my job, I told the Lord, it was not my idea to come out into full-time ministry, it was your idea. <laughs> therefore, therefore, from this day onwards, that was 1st January 1983, I made a vow. I will never open my mouth and ask anybody for my personal needs because you are my employer. And the employer's responsibility is to take care of the employee. Right? So, so I told God, you have two responsibilities. Not only you are my employer, you are my father. So you have two responsibilities. Until today, I've never stood in the more than 50 countries that I've been to, opening my mouth to ask for my needs. I've appealed for the ministry, but not for my needs. But here will come false prophets, false teachers, false apostles, false Christ. And the scriptures tell us their cardinal fruit in their life is an overemphasis on money. Give me this, give me that. I need six hundred and six seventy million dollars to buy an aeroplane. Just to go from point A to point B within the US. See, these are the fruit, right? The fruit is there. But there will come in the last days such things. And God has already warned us. We need to open our eyes to be aware of such things. But why are we still being milk? Because of the lust that's in our hearts. There is a lust in our hearts for money, for greed. So here comes someone who promises you that if you sow into my ministry, you will get a car, you'll get a house, you'll get this, you'll get that. So it, it feeds the monster that's inside you. That's a wolf inside you, you know. It feeds that lust. So when one lust meets another lust, it's two happy lusts. That's a gay community. <laughs> right? And like joins itself with another like. So such people will want such teachers. Because you're feeding lust, feeding into another lust. I profit from you, you profit from me. An anti crisis, false crisis. Now, this is something very easy to identify, yet, there are countless people all over the world who are duped into believing anti crisis. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 5, Mark chapter 13, verse 21. And 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, false crisis, even the Apostle John says, they have gone out from us, which means once upon a time, they were good people. So deception got in. You know, recently, there is, there is a video clip that is going viral on the internet about a young man, maybe in his early 30s, from Australia, who claims that he is Jesus Christ. Have you seen that? And his girlfriend is called Mary Magdalene. 
You haven't seen that? Oh, you poor naive people. How, how naive you all are. Come on, go on the YouTube, you can find all that. This guy, he says, you know, oh, and I was Jesus. He is not ashamed to say that. And this girlfriend of mine is Mary Magdalene. And he teaches. And there is a huge bunch of people who have sold all and given to him. And they've all become his followers. So there will always be such deceptive people who will want to be deceived. The Lord Jesus Christ very simply said, you know, when I come back, it will be like the lightning that strikes on the east, that's seen in the west. If they say, oh, he's there, oh, he's in Houston, oh, he's in Bear Creek, don't believe. Don't believe. Because when I come, all eyes will see me. Not only a few Australians, not only a few Americans here, or a few Koreans there, or a few Filipinos there. There are crises everywhere, you know, in all these nations. See, this is a basic identifying mark. So why are we dumb not knowing that? You know, no matter how much of revelation we can get for these last days, this is the basic fundamental foundation. You must have this inside you. You know, anything else can build up on this. But this is the foundation. The many, many foundational principles in the world, God doesn't violate them. God does not overrule them. They will not be superseded by any latest end-time revelations. Some may, some may. Because they may not be applicable for the end times. For example, let me give you an example. Like how some may. The Lord Jesus told the people, you have heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now who said that? But who told that to Moses? God, right? It was God. God gave the revelation to the prophet Moses for the people living under the old covenant. Then the Lord just said, but I say unto you, if somebody slaps you on your right cheek, turn your left. See, in the new covenant, it replaced something the old. So this same thing can be replaced in the last days. It can, like that. However, foundational truths like the love of God, the goodness of God, the centrality of Christ's divinity, that will not be replaced. Those are the foundations. God is one but three. Foundation. It can never change. So those foundational principles, truths, must be cemented or be the foundation of your life. So get this word deep inside you. Whether you understand or you don't understand, read and read and read and read. One fine day, a river of revelation will flow. The umpteen time that you are reading the same scripture, suddenly the Holy Spirit sparks a revelation to you. It will happen. So till then keep on reading. Have you seen the mouse on a wheel? You've never... You poor Americans. You all must come to India. You've never seen all those old-fashioned experiments where the scientists will put a mouse on a wheel and the poor wheel, poor mouse goes running all forever and forever? It's like that, you know. So be the word of God is like the wheel. You are like the mouse in the wheel. Keep running with the word. Keep running. Keep running. One day, 
Once in a while, it will just stop. That's when you get a revelation. Be full of the word. Colossians 3.16 says, Be filled with the word of God. Amen. So false apostles will also come. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. And false teachings, they are already going out all over the world. That all are one now. Hindus, Muslims, Christians, all are one. Have you heard of this new fat religion called Chrislam? No. What kind of Americans you all are? It was given birth in America. Right from California. It was given birth in California. And now it's been exported all over the world. Seeker friendly church that has now replaced the cross. You know, the church that founded that seeker-friendly teaching invited President Obama to speak at their church the last year or the year before last. So, and President Obama accepted the invitation on one condition. He said, when I come to your church, there must not be any pictures of Christ in the church. <laughs> yeah, it's all documented, you know. So, the senior pastor had his deacons cover up all pictures of Christ, including the cross. They were all covered up with a cloth. Obama is supposed to be a Christian, right? At least externally he claims, right? We know he's a Muslim. We all know. We all know. In fact, his name says that. You cannot deny that. Anyway, the church complied to the president's demands. There was a huge cross on the stage. They had a drap put over the cross. It was covered. And President Obama stands at the pulpit and he speaks to the congregation. Why did he do that? And those same church teaches all its affiliates who want to be part of the seeker-friendly denomination. Don't preach the cross. You know that? Don't preach the cross. There must not be any Christian symbols in the church building because it will frighten the non-Christians. It's the preaching of the cross that will save a sinner, you know. Right? It's the preaching of the cross that will save the sinner. What others is going to save a sinner? Not all your wonderful stories. Right? All the appetizers, you can give any kind of appetizers. Your appetizers can become the main cause, but that's not going to save you. Only the preaching of the cross. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Not all the technological light, sound, and displays. That will not. It just entertains. Does not convict. It entertains. Comes scantily dressed. Doesn't matter. God loves you as you are. You know, when I first preached in Pastor Joe's church in 2003, I saw a bunch of about uh, 50 Young people wearing shorts, so short, and t shirts sleeveless and quite scantily, you know. And I looked at the kids and I told them, see, I'm from conservative Republican Party. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked at them and said, what is this? Are you going to a beach party? You all dress like you are going for a beach party. Have you forgotten that you are in the house of God? Say, what is this filthy dressing? Those 50 kids, young people got so offended, they stood up and they walked out. Later on I found out they are all from a Bible school students. See, 
anything goes. God does not look at you, how you are dressed outside. Whether your top is visible or invisible, God doesn't look at all that. God looks at your heart. It's very true. But man looks at the outward. Right? I agree that God looks at the heart. But man looks at the outward. He doesn't see your heart. See, these are the kind of creepy stuffs that are creeping into the church that makes it. You know what is this? This is nothing else but the teachings of Jezebel and Astaroth. She promotes lasciviousness, licentiousness, lewdness. It is her, her demonic teachings that has been released into the church. That you begin to open up your heart. Said all this is okay. Anything is okay. Sleeping with one another because it's your soulmate. The wife that you married or the man you married is not your real husband. He's not your real partner. Because that's not what God intended. These are another lies that's spreading now in the church. Not outside, you know. You won't find such, sadly, you don't find such teachings in a Muslim mosque. Or a Hindu temple. Or in a Buddhist monastery. All these are taking place in the church. By false teachers, false prophets, and false apostles. See, they all have one word. False. But they are a prophet, they are a teacher, they are an apostle. Once upon a time, they had the true anointing of God. Then came the faults. Then came the deception that added on. But because once upon a time they were good, you keep on sitting under them. Even when you can see the faults. Now you begin to think, oh, once upon a time they were good. Now this new teaching must also be good. No. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. This is the white horse that's going. See, it go forth conquering a horse means it will spread very fast. It spreads very fast. False apostles, antichrists, the apostle John very sadly says they've gone out from us. First John 2.19. They've gone out from us, meaning... Once upon a time, they were in the company of good believers. They were a good believer. They were a good teacher. They were a good prophet, good apostle. And then they got some new light. And they began to say, I am Christ. That's why John calls them anti -crisis. And they've gone out from us. So be careful. The deceivers will not come from outside. They will come from within us, out from us. So when they are from us, how can you know the sheep from the wolves? How can you know? When the wolves come clothed with sheep's clothing. That's how riding, red, red hood, riding hood got deceived, you know? Yeah, sorry, got mixed up. Little red riding hood, right? Uh, see, the bad wolf came, right? Like a grandma. And that poor little girl got deceived until the wolf opened its mouth. Then it got, at least that little girl had some common sense to know that it was a wolf when it opens its mouth. But my people don't even have that sense when these false teachers open their mouth. God's people don't even have that sense. When they open their mouth, when they're hearing something wrong, when they're hearing something not of God, they're still duped and deceived. 